to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel the of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of and Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The disciples of Christ said, Lord, teach us to pray. Luke chapter 11, verse number 1. We welcome you today to our study on the beautiful subject of prayer. Today we're going to be thinking about some of the fundamentals of prayer, specifically the how, the what, and the when of prayer. We hope you'll get your Bible and stay tuned as we study this wonderful subject from the Word of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Pray without ceasing. And as we think about the how, the who, and the what of prayer, we realize that Christians must know and must be convicted of the importance of prayer and need for it in their life. This is why Paul taught us to pray without ceasing. Never let there be a time in your life when you can't pray to God. And we can surely see that in the life of Jesus. Do you remember Matthew 14 verse 23? Jesus had been teaching the multitudes and Jesus sent the multitudes away. He went up by Himself on the mountain to pray. Jesus needed prayer in His life. Matthew 26 verse 53, even in that great moment of struggle in the garden, Jesus said, Do you not think that I cannot now pray to my Father and receive twelve legions of angels to help? Jesus understood the power and need of prayer. And friends, if we can be convinced of a correct understanding of what prayer is and how it should be used, it will help us to utilize that power in our own lives. And so we begin by asking, what does the Bible say on the subject of prayer? Let's talk about some of the prerequisites that are necessary for one to pray as God wants him to. For example, one must be taught how to pray scripturally. It's not the case that I can ju just get up and pray any old way that I want to or say anything I want to or do anything I want to in prayer. You've got to be taught from the Bible by God how to pray correctly. Luke 11, 1 clearly teaches this. Jesus' disciples had heard John's disciples pray. John had taught his disciples, and so the disciples of Christ came to him and they said, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples to pray. Wouldn't you have loved to sat at the feet of Jesus and learned how to pray? Well, friend, isn't that what we find in the Bible? We can hear Jesus pray. We can see what Jesus taught His disciples and what God's taught us to pray. And I can learn how to pray the way God wants me to. In so doing, I will pray in a way that will honor and magnify Almighty God. You know, as part of the prerequisites to prayer, let's also realize I've got to pray, if I'm going to pray correctly, I need to pray with a firm belief and commitment in God's ability to help. Uh, Mark chapter 11 verse 24, Matthew 21 verse 22, we know God knows what we need. We're taught to pray in faith with no doubt. We're to seek, we're to knock, we're to ask, and we're to be convicted that God can help us. This is why James said in James 1 verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. Why? He who doubts is like a wave of the sea, tossed and driven by the wind. Friend, if I'm going to pray correctly, I need to have a commitment, a firm conviction. God does hear. God does know. And because of my faith in God and the evidence of Him, I know God wants me to pray and wants to help in my time of need. We're not talking about someone saying, well, I hope God does this, or if I pray, God might care, or you know, wishful thinking, or best guess, or, or any doubt involved in that. We all pray in view of the Lord's will, but when we pray, 
we need to pray with conviction and commitment that God wants to help us accomplish His will on this earth. Then another prerequisite that is so important to prayer is we need to pray according to the will of God. I want you to notice what the Scripture says in 1 John chapter 5 about this idea. 1 John chapter 5 verse number 15 specifically addresses the Christian praying uh, in view of the will of God and as God would want him to pray. Here's what that verse says. And if we know He hears us, whatever we ask, we know we have the petitions we've asked of Him. If, verse 14 says, if we ask according to His will. What's the will of God? Talk to us in the Bible. It's what we as Christians have the mindset of doing. It's what Jesus said in Matthew 27, verse 46, and Matthew 26, verse 39, Not my will, but thine be done. We hear Christians say sometimes, If the things we've prayed for are according to your will, we pray that you'll accomplish those. If not, we pray that you'll defeat us in the things that are not. Friend, we want to have the mindset, If this is your will, all that we pray is contingent upon ultimately the will of God being done first and His ultimate plan being accomplished. And then as another prerequisite, we want to have a humble attitude when we pray. Uh, Luke 14, 11, the Bible says, whoever humbles himself, he'll be exalted. Whoever exalts himself, he'll be humbled. Now, let me ask you this question. Do you ever see anybody in the Bible who prayed with a haughty, self-righteous, ungodly attitude. Well, sure we do. You remember Luke chapter 18? Listen to the story of the two men who went up to the temple to pray. One had a great attitude and the other, he felt like God needed him on his side. Listen to Luke 18, beginning in verse number 10. The scripture records, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, and the other a tax collector. Now watch this Pharisee. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Can you imagine a man praying like that? Imagine someone bowing their head and saying, God, thank you that you've made me better than everybody else. Thank you that you didn't make me like this tax collector. And by the way, let me tell you why you need me. I pray, I fast, I give. Look at what I do. Thank you for not making me like everybody else. And thank you that I am who I am. What a haughty, self-righteous man. What about the tax collector? The story goes on to tell us the tax collector wouldn't even look up to heaven. He beat his breast and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus, in essence, said, which of those two do you think God heard? Not the one who was glad he was better than everybody else and thought he was righteous, but the one who knew he wasn't and needed God. Friend, let's not pray with a haughty, self-righteous, pious attitude. We need to pray in humility of heart. We need to recognize, and you, me, when we've done all those things commanded us, say, I'm an unprofitable servant. I've only done that which was my duty to do. Now, we mention another prerequisite, another how to prayer, and it's this. We need to make sure that we don't pray uh, like the hypocrites. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 7, Jesus condemned the hypocrites when he said, they stand on the street corners. Uh, they pray these long prayers. They have to be wearing the right garments. They have to be in the right place and they have to make sure everybody's watching them. Jesus said they go halfway around the world to make a disciple. Then they make them twice as much the son of hell as themselves. What was wrong with those people? They wanted the glory. They wanted to be looked up as the spiritual elite. They wanted everybody to say, wow, look at that man pray. He must be close to God. They weren't giving God the glory in their prayer. They were trying to receive glory from their prayer. Friend, when we pray, we don't have to use the big words. I'm not saying that's in and of itself wrong, but we don't have to do it for everybody to look at us. I don't have to 
pray a long prayer so everybody can think, wow, he really knows how to talk to God. I don't have to use big words, big religious words, so people can say, boy, he's really smart in praying to God. Or we don't have to do it in the right place and say, so people can look at us and say, look at him, he must be a spiritual person. If our mindset is to have people look at us when we pray, to have people think highly of us when we pray, friend, we've missed the whole purpose of what prayer is all about. Remember what Jesus said? In contrast to those hypocrites, Jesus said in you, when you pray, don't stand out on the street corner and do like that did. Instead, He said, go into your upper room. When you're in your upper room, shut the door. Go into your closet, in essence, as it were. And when you pray, pray in secret to your Father in secret. And He blesses those who pray that way. Our prayers need to have a sense of humility and a sense of knowing that God hears based on who we really are. Like the tax collector, God be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the attitude that we as Christians need to have. Then as we think about a prerequisite to prayer, part of the how, we need to recognize prayer should always be offered in the name of Christ. John 14, verses 13 and 14, Jesus said, If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 through 6, There is one God, one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus Himself. Who's the mediator? Christ. Who do we pray through? Christ. Whose name do we and whose authority do we pray in? The name and the authority of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christians don't close the prayer in Jesus' name because that's what we've done for a thousand years, two thousand years. We do that because that's how God, that's how Christ has taught us to pray scripturally in the Bible to honor Him and to show Him as our mediator, as our dependence is given upon Him in every way. You know, as we think about part of the how of prayer, we also need to realize that scriptural prayer, prayer that honors God, is a prayer that is thought about. Prayer that is given with the spirit and understanding. We often apply this to singing, but the verse also applies it to prayer. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 15, I will pray with the Spirit, and I'll pray with the understanding. I'll sing with the Spirit, and I'll sing with the understanding. What's that mean? If I'm going to pray with the Spirit and sing with the Spirit, my person is involved in that. My emotion, it's heartfelt. Uh, my intellect is involved in that as well. So I'll pray with the Spirit and with the understanding. That means that our prayers don't need to be just verbiage that we've always heard and so we say it as well. It doesn't need to be some rote words that somebody said and we kind of like those one time and so we work it into our prayer no matter what. Prayer needs to come from the heart. Prayer needs to be thought about. When I pray, and, and this is a struggle that we all have at times, when we pray we need to stay focused. We need to really think about what we're saying. We need to communicate with God and we need to do our best not to let our mind and our heart wander in times like those. That's real prayer and singing with the Spirit and with the understanding. But friend, let's also realize this. As part of the how, in praying correctly, I must pray. I must pray in such a way that not only it honors and glorifies God, but to pray correctly, I need to be right with God and with my brother. To have prayer be what God wants it to be, I've got to be in a relationship with God. Again, we mentioned the verse in Psalm 66, 18. God heareth not the prayer of sinners. John 9, verse 4, and Psalm 66, verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Proverbs 28, verse 9. He who turns his ear away from hearing the law, the Lord doesn't hear that man's prayer. His face is set against those who do evil. 1 Peter 3, and verse 12. And so, for prayer to be what it's designed to be, for it to be effective, for God to hear it, I've got to be in a relationship with the Father. To talk to the Father, I've got to be a child of the Father. I've got to be a son or a daughter of God. But then as a Christian, and as part of the, the requirements for prayer, not only do I have to make sure I'm in a right relationship with God, trying to walk in the light, trying to do what God wants me to, I need to also look at my relationship with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Not only must I love the Lord the God, my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, I've got to love my neighbor as myself. 
how's my relationship with other Christians? Is there anybody who I've offended or sinned against that I've not made right? Uh, let me show you the words of Jesus. Let me share with you the words of Christ as it related to this. In Mark chapter 11, listen to what Jesus says in verse number 25. Jesus said, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, Forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. If I stand to pray and I realize I've got a fault with somebody, somebody's got a fault with me, I need to be ready and willing to forgive if that person's willing to repent. Uh, you know, you see the example of somebody is at the altar and they realize their brother has a fault with them. Leave your sacrifice at the altar, make it right with your brother, then come worship God. There's the idea of prayer is dependent upon my relationship with God being right and my relationship with others also being what God wants it to be. Now, let's speak a little more specifically about maybe a, a practical plan. How does God want me to pray? What's a plan for prayer as found in the Scripture? And friend, we can be rest assured by knowing that God has taught us how to have a, a good practical plan, an everyday approach for prayer. Prayer, according to the pattern of Jesus, ought to be one of the first things we do when the foot hits the floor every morning. The Bible says of Jesus in Mark 1 verse 35, in the morning, a great while before daylight, he departed, went to a solitary place, and prayed. Think about this. First thing in the morning, a great while before daylight, Jesus likely got up early. It was one of his first thoughts in the morning. Jesus got away from the rat race of life, and he took time to pray to God. Could you think of a better way to start your day than with prayer? Secondly, prayer ought to be made especially for parents. And if you don't have this habit, you've got to work very difficult, very hard at it. But especially for parents. Parents ought to teach their children to make a good habit out of prayer. Friend, there's nothing wrong with having a good habit of prayer. Daniel had that. Daniel 6 verse 10, listen to this. As was his custom from early days, from childhood, Daniel prayed three times that day with his window open toward Jerusalem. Who taught Daniel that custom? Likely his parents. It was a habit. Daniel had a habit of praying three times every day. It was a part of his life, like brushing his teeth, like eating cereal in the morning, whatever it may be, like combing your hair or taking a shower. Daniel had a good habit of prayer. And friend, a person needs to develop that kind of habit in his own life. Prayer to really follow the plan God wants it to be. It ought to be a private time between you and God. Go into your upper room. When you're there, close the door. Pray to your Father. It ought to be a time just between a man and God. A time when a man can get down on his hands and knees and communicate with the Father. To pray in thanksgiving, to pray in adoration, to pray and asking God for certain things, whatever it may be. We each need that time to communicate directly and personally with Almighty God. You know, a biblical plan that we find is morning, noon, and evening. Listen to the words of Psalm 55. I want you to notice the plan that the psalmist set forth in Psalm 55, verse number 17. The psalmist said these words about his own plan for prayer. He said in Psalm 55, verse 17, Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud, and He shall hear my voice. Evening, morning, and noon. There was a plan. He had a, a set time that he wanted to do that. And as long as it's with the Spirit and understanding, there's nothing wrong with having a set pattern when we pray and when we talk to God. But friend, let's realize this. Prayer really ought to be kind of a constant in our life. I'm not saying everything we do is a prayer. I'm not saying from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, you're always in prayer. But there ought never to be a time when we can't pray. Acts 2 verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse number 17. And so in our life, let's make sure that there's never a point when we're too proud or haughty or, or too discouraged to get down and ask God for His help. 
His thanksgiving in times when we live our life. Then, we want to offer kind of a, maybe a prescribed method of prayer, prescribed way from Scripture of things that we specifically ought to mention in prayer. What should I pray for when I pray? You ever thought about that? What does the Bible say specifically that a Christian ought to pray for? Here are some of those things. We ought to first pray for the lost. Jesus said, pray the Lord of hosts that He'll send laborers into His harvest. When we pray, we want to pray for those who never obeyed the gospel. Do we really believe and realize that the majority of this earth's population is going down the path that's going to lead to eternal destruction? If so, and if Jesus taught us to pray for the lost, friend, that ought to be something that's a regular part of our prayer. Secondly, as we think about what to pray for, we ought to pray to overcome sin and Satan in our own life. Men ought always to pray and never lose heart or get discouraged. Uh, Jesus taught us in Matthew 6 to pray that our trespasses would be forgiven as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Uh, again, the idea that we want to pray to overcome sin and to overcome Satan. Deliver us not, or lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Matthew chapter 6, verses 6 through 12. We also as Christians want to pray for forgiveness of sin. None of us are perfect. The Bible teaches us clearly that there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. As Christians, when we pray, we need to have the attitude and the mindset that if we have unwittingly, unknowingly violated the will of God, if we're trying to walk in the light and we have unknowingly violated the will of God, uh, we need to pray that God will forgive us. And if we know specifically for sure that there's sin in our life, Peter taught Simon, pray the evil thought of your heart might be forgiven you. Acts chapter 8 verses 22 through 24. In repenting of those sins, surely we need to have the attitude, I'm going to pray to God and ask Him for help in overcoming this. And then as Christians, the Bible teaches that prayer should be offered for those who are sick and those who are suffering. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over them. Prayer has the ability to help those who are suffering to help those who are sick. May the God of all comfort comfort you in your trouble. Paul would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 3. As Christians, we also want to pray for those who are living in error. It's sad, but there are at times those who do fall away from the truth. There are those who fall away from living faithfully as God wants them to do. I cannot replace prayer with going to talk to them, but both ought to work together in encouraging them and teaching them, I ought to pray for them as well. 1 John 5 verse 16 clearly teaches we pray for those who are in error and we want to pray that they'll come back to the truth and obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now friend, I'll assure you this is something that we all need to pray for. Don't we need to pray for wisdom? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Why? Who gives to all liberally and without reproach. I need to pray for the ability. Here's what wisdom is. Wisdom is different from facts in that facts are the knowledge. Wisdom's the ability to take that knowledge and plug it into my life tomorrow. I need the ability to understand how, to have the wisdom to know how to put God's truth, insert God's truth into my daily life. And friends, surely we want to pray for the wisdom to know how to do that. I want to pray for the necessities of life. Uh, Philippians 4 verses 6 through 9, we're to pray for those needs. James 4 verses 3 through 4, the things that we need, we ought to ask for those things. I want to pray, and friend, listen carefully, there's nothing wrong with praying before one eats. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 4 through 5, our food is sanctified by the Word of God and prayer. God said it's okay to eat it, so that's why. And secondly, it's set apart by prayer. There's nothing wrong with praying before a person eats. In fact, the Scripture does teach that is something that the child of God ought to do. And friend, we want to mention, specifically in the day and age especially in which we live, we want to mention one other thing. First Timothy chapter 2, verses 1-3, through 3, Paul said, I desire therefore that men pray for kings, for all who are in authority, 
that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Godliness and reverence. What ought we to pray for? We ought to pray for our world leaders. We ought to pray for our national leaders. We ought to pray for our elected leaders. We ought to pray for our government. And more than anything, we ought to pray that they'll start doing, if they're not, they'll start doing the will of God, that this country can be one nation under God, and that God's will and the Word of God will be that which we really guide our life and our country by. And so these are things practically every day that a Christian ought to pray for. Friend, we hope that this lesson has been an encouragement to every one of us to really utilize the power of prayer. Remember, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. Let's use prayer, for prayer has powerful results. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.